Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Darwin was inspired by the creatures of the Galapagos, but over the next million years, the human survivors of the nature cruise of the century are quietly evolving there into sleek, furry creatures with flippers and small brains. All other forms of humankind have ceased to exist, finally made redundant by their own prized big brains. All that survives of big brain culture is contained by Mandorax. 20,000 quotations and a thousand languages. Unfortunately, or perhaps not, this tiny electronic marvel doesn't know Cancabono, language of the cannibal girls who are to mother the new humanity. In Vonnegut's blistering new satire, natural selection is a series of crazy accidents as the improbable stories of an Ecuadorian admiral, an American bigamist, a widowed high school teacher and a Japanese computer genius are woven into the genetic fabric of a future that will seem dark only to those with obsolescence, unreliable big brains. Fortunately, the ghost of Kilgore Trout's son is on hand to make sense of it all. Yeah, if that doesn't sound batshit crazy, I don't know what is. And uh, what I thought was great going straight into this, I, I just read uh, The Honorary Consul by Graham Greene. And it has a Graham Greene quote. It says, Graham Greene has called him one of the best living American writers. And no matter what type of fiction Vonnegut claims to be writing, his commitment to humanity and his special concern for its more fallible specimen illumines all his work. So I do quite like this gimmick of like looking back at almost our present day. I think it was set in like 1986. Uh, from a million years in the future and uh, he puts asterisks by the names of people who are going to die within the next 24 hours Which I enjoyed and uh, there's an asterisk by Macintosh's name here and now uh, we've got this great quote Macintosh was barefoot and wearing nothing but a pair of khaki shorts whose fly was unbuttoned and under which he wore no underwear So that his penis was no more a secret than the pendulum on a grandfather clock and um, I assume this is based on like a true fact as well, um, but it's very sad there, in Elaine's restaurant, Macintosh angered his spellbound audience with tales of boots crushing the camouflaged nests of iguanas, of greedy fingers stealing the eggs of boobies, and on and on. His most moving atrocity story by far, though, again lifted from the National Geographic, was of persons cradling fur seal pups in their arms as though they were human infants, for the sake of photographs. When the pup was returned to its mother, he said bitterly, she would no longer nurse it because its smell had been changed. So what happens to that darling pup which has just had the great honour of being cuddled by a big hearted nature lover, asked Macintosh. It starves to death, all for the sake of a photograph. God, human, pe human beings are disgusting, aren't they? And uh, I just love this because there's some great stuff on gender through the lens of these boobies. Some students would ask permission to write about some other Galapagos Islands creature, and Mary, being such a good teacher, would of course answer yes. And the favourite alternatives were those teasers and robbers of the boobies, the great frigate birds. These James Waits of the bird world survived on fish which boobies caught and got their nesting materials from nests which boobies built. A certain sort of student found this hilarious and such a student was almost invariably male. And uh, later on we get, after Mary Hepburn showed her film about the great frigate birds and the window shades in the classroom were raised and the lights turned back on, some student, again almost invariably a male, was sure to ask, sometimes clinically, sometimes as a comedian, sometimes bitterly, hating and fearing women, do the females always try to pick the biggest ones? So Mary was ready with a reply as consistent word by word as any quotation known by Mandarax. To answer that, we would have to interview female great frigate birds, and no one has done that yet, so far as I know. So there's a great combination between Carson and the captain. We'll be Carson on the left, captain on the right. Some people think Hitler might still be alive and living in South America. Do you think there's any chance of that? I know there are persons in Ecuador who would love to have him for dinner. Nazi sympathizers? I don't know about that. It's possible, I suppose. Well, if they would be glad to have Hitler for dinner, then they must be cannibals. I was thinking of the Cancabonos. They are glad to have almost anybody for dinner. They are, what's the English word? It's on the tip of my tongue. I think I'll pass on this one. They are, they are, the Cancabonos are, take your time. Aha, they are apolitical, that's the word. Apolitical is what the Cancabonos are. Oh good. I know there's a reference to Count Dracula and it says, this entirely fictitious count she knew was a far more significant person to most of her students than George Washington, for instance, who is merely the founder of their country. And uh, here is a quotation well known to Mandarak. A little neglect may breed great mischief. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. Benjamin Franklin, 1706, 1790. And doesn't that quote then end, for want of a rider, the battle was lost? And for want of a battle, the war was lost. I thought this was a great quote as well. I disturbed my father at his typewriter and asked him what my heritage was from his side of the family. 
I didn't know then what sperm was and so wouldn't understand his answer for several years. My boy, he said, you were descended from a long line of determined, resourceful, microscopic tadpoles. Champions, every one. We get just the line, in all the encounters between Davids and Goliaths, was there ever a time when a Goliath won? I think that probably was, mate, yes. And I like this um, mention of, like, I guess the evolution of man and whatnot. And the, again, this massive one million year time scale. People mostly eat raw fish now. People still get the hiccups, incidentally. They still have no control over whether they do it or not. I often hear them hiccuping, involuntarily closing their glottises and inhaling spasmodically as they lie on the broad white beaches or paddle around the blue lagoons. If anything, people hiccup more now than they did a million years ago. This has less to do with evolution, I think, than with the fact that so many of them gulp down raw fish without chewing them up sufficiently. Gross. And then we end. The final two lines are, But I can't speak Swedish, I said. You'll learn, he said. You'll learn. You'll learn. Because he's uh, going to Sweden for, like, political immunity or whatever. But I happen to know that in Sweden, the most frequently learned language on Duolingo is Swedish from uh, immigrants who are learning the language. Fun fact. So yeah, overall Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. I thought it was a great little send up. That's what uh, Vonnegut's best at. Some great satire in here. Interesting stuff on like the passage of time. A nice like little riff on, uh, on the origin of species. And actually you're probably gonna enjoy this more if you have at least an understanding of evolution. If you've read the origin of species, even better. But uh, yeah, I gave it a pretty strong 3.5 out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.